from Microbe TV. This is Infectious Disease Podcast, Episode 8, recorded on August 3rd, 2022. I'm Daniel Griffin, and joining me today is Sarah Dog. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another Puscast. References, as always, are available in our show notes at microbe.tv, the home of our growing multimedia empire. Puscast is a review of the infectious disease literature for the last two weeks that we found interesting or entertaining. Now on to the literature, shall we? And I'm going to start us off with the viral section. Remember to listen to TWIV clinical updates for COVID and monkeypox related information. Um, But I'll start because there seemed to be a pretty big breakthrough in the pediatric hepatitis cases. I'm going to preface this by saying that we're not typically going to be talking about preprints or non-peer reviewed papers, but I thought this was important news that was worth mentioning. Um, So co-infection with two viruses, so adeno-associated virus 2 or AAV2 and an adenovirus or less often HHV6 seems to be the best explanation for the recent cases of acute hepatitis seen in children based on studies from London and Glasgow. Both independently found that AAV2 was present in high levels in blood samples And so this virus, the AAV2, is actually not an adenovirus. It's a parvovirus and needs a helper virus for it to replicate. And so AAV2 was found in plasma using next-generation sequencing and real-time PCR in all nine cases, and actually in the liver of the four that were available to test, and then in zero of the 58 matched controls. Um, Additionally, Uh, Related to this, there was a genetic variant in children that was found in eight of the nine cases, which is typically only present in about 15% of the population. And um, this is something that's typically associated with autoimmune hepatitis or extra articular manifestations of rheumatoid arthritis. So this might potentially indicate some type of genetic susceptibility. And so the authors propose that perhaps reduce exposure to AAV2 and adeno and herpes viruses during the COVID lockdown may have contributed to more co-circulation, um, thus leading to increased cases with this uh, rare complication. And so these preprints are from, um, we'll put them in the links, but both related to, I'll list it, adeno-associated virus 2 infection in children with non a Um, to E. hepatitis, and then genomic investigations of acute hepatitis of unknown etiology in children. All right. I I found this actually quite fascinating. And I ran it by Vincent, you know, who's run (laughs) run by things. And uh, yeah, he was actually found this quite um, compelling as well. So um, excited to see how this evolves. All right. The paper, Duration of Protection After Vaccination Against Yellow Fever Systemic Review and Meta-Analysis was published in CID. Eventually, y'all have to memorize our, uh, you know, what CID and JID and JPIDs. uh, There'll be a test at the end. Um, It used to be pretty routine to get periodic yellow fever vaccinations every 10 years until 2013 when the WHO suggested that one vaccination uh, could confer lifelong immunity in most individuals unless they had certain immunity deficiencies. So here, the authors identified 36 studies from 20 countries comprising over 17,000 participants aged six months to 85 years among healthy adults and children pooled seroprotection rates after single vaccination dose were close to 100% by three months and remained high in adults for five to 10 years. In children vaccinated before age two, the seroprotection rate was, I'm going to throw an only in here, 52%, within five years after primary vaccination. Um, For immunodeficient persons, the data indicated relevant waning. Now, they seem to conclude with a, we are not so certain about how much science supports the idea of lifelong immunity after just one shot. So more to come. Yeah. In OFID, there was a paper published, Impact of Implementing the Cerebrospinal Fluid, CSF, Film Array, Meningitis Encephalitis Panel, on duration of IV acyclovir treatment. And so this study looked at acyclovir treatment trends in patients who were tested with the traditional CSF PCR versus the CSF BioFire panel test and found that implementation of the BioFire panel at their center, so Columbia and Children's Hospital in New York, shortened CSF HSV1 PCR result time and IV acyclovir duration. So from, for example, 
two versus 4.8 days in children, or three versus a little under five days in adults. It didn't show any significant changes in nephrotoxicity between patients and the biofire versus PCR group. Um, and the authors kind of argued less acyclovir means reduced costs, which would go towards how much uh, the biofire panel cost. There is always the concern about possible false negatives with the panel. And so it's interesting because their study found that the time from CSF result to stopping acyclovir was shorter in the standalone PCR group compared to biofire. Um, and the authors had mentioned, you know, maybe the patients were already better at that point or some other diagnostic had come back in that time um, that it took to get that standalone PCR result. Um, and this difference was most notable actually in adults. Um, so the difference in timing being 0.9 days versus 2.2 days. But I thought that was interesting. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people still don't feel as confident in the biofire as they do with the standalone PCR. Um, so I wonder how much that contributed as well. All right. In the MMWR, notes from the field, cluster of Pareco virus central nervous system infections in young adults, Tennessee 2022. Uh, this described a number of cases of Pareco virus during April 12 through May 24, 2022. 23 previously healthy infants aged five days to three months, really little guys, were admitted to a Tennessee Children's Hospital for Human Parechovirus Meningoencephalitis. Um, so our listeners might remember Parechovirus is a non-enveloped RNA virus of the Picornoviridae family. Um, these infections um, usually present as self-limiting gastroenteritis, um, but they can actually range all the way to severe sepsis-like disease and CNS infection, particularly in infants um, aged less than three months. Uh, so just really putting this on the horizon, um, they mentioned 23 hospitalized, actually was another um, individual who did not require hospitalization, but was in the same cluster of cases. All right, bacterial. Um, you know, we need a This Week in Bacteria. I guess we have This Week in Micro, so <laughs> send people that way. Um, not sure how many of our listeners are regular readers of the Journal of Antimicrobial Therapy, but you should be. They recently published the article, Molecular Ecology and Risk Factors for Third-Generation Cephalosporin Resistant E. coli Carriage by Dogs Living in Urban and Nearby Rural Settings. Um, People probably know I'm a dog lover, right? So I have pictures of Biden recovering with his dog. And I was like, the poor dog. You're supposed to be <laughs> isolating. What about the dog? Anyway, more on the topic of how the sky is falling, and we will soon be facing the post-antibiotic apocalypse. So 600 dogs were included. Um, it was actually the feces, not the dogs, that got included. But fecal samples were processed to recover third-generation cephalosporin-resistant E. coli, Whole genome sequencing is performed, and they used owner-completed surveys. They found lots of third-generation cephalosporin-resistant E. coli in the feces and observed an association with feeding the dogs raw meat in rural but not in urban settings, and they suggested there might be some connection between resistant E. coli in the dogs and cattle. Daniel, I just say one of the first research things that I did as a resident um, was going into patient rooms of patients who had C. diff and asking if we could, if they could collect their dog's poop and send it in. Um, so anyways, just getting some flashbacks from that experience. Yeah, good ones, um, but, good ones. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, in an official CDC health advisory, Meliodosis, locally endemic in areas of Mississippi Gulf Coast after Burkholderia pseudomallei associate isolated in soil and water and linked to two cases, Mississippi 2020 and 2022. Uh, so this came out in July 27th. Uh, the CDC identified the bacterium Burkholderia pseudomallei that causes myelodosis for the first time in the environment in the continental U.S. through sampling of soil and water in the Gulf Coast region of southern Mississippi um, while looking at these two human cases. It's unclear how widespread this is at the moment, but modeling suggests that the areas in the Gulf Coast states um, certainly have conducive environmental conditions for this organism. And the two patients uh, were unrelated to one another, but lived in close proximity uh, in Mississippi 
Neither had traveled outside of the U.S., and they were diagnosed two years apart, so July of 2020 and then May of this year, 2022, um, when they developed sepsis and pneumonia and ultimately had positive blood cultures. Genomic sequencing demonstrated that they were infected by the same novel strain from the Western Hemisphere. And a refresher for those who have not been thinking about meliodosis is a gram-negative organism that's classically described in tropical climates. Uh, so you typically think of Southeast Asia, Northern Australia, and parts of Central and South America. Uh, there were some cases reported, though, in in 2021, so last year, when there was a cluster linked to imported contaminated aromatherapy spray. Um, and so it can lead to localized infection, pneumonia, bacteremia, or disseminated infection. And so on this advisory, the CDC wants you to consider meliodosis in patients with a compatible illness who reside in or have traveled to the Gulf Coast region of the southern U.S. or, of course, areas where uh, B. pseudomalli has historically been endemic. Um, and in particular, thinking about this in patients who have risk factors, so those with diabetes, uh, alcohol use, chronic lung disease, or immunosuppressive conditions, um, those who report occupational or recreational activities involving handling of soil, so gardening, agriculture, and construction work, and those who've had recent contact with fresh water, such as swimming or fishing in lakes, ponds, or rivers in the area. All right. Ugh. Um, yeah, no, this is a tough one. You know, this is one that uh, was usually part of the tropical medicine curriculum, sort of our Southeast yeah. Asia, our Vietnam, Vietnamese time bomb, um, you know, stuff that we saw in Northern Australia and the like. So welcome to the U.S. <laughs> All right. The article, early switch from intravenous to oral antibiotics in skin and soft tissue infections, an algorithm-based prospective multicenter pilot study published in Open Forum Infectious Disease. Just a little background here. Um, we're talking about purulent and non-purulent cellulitis or erysipelas. Um, and we have the July 15, 2014 guidelines. Those are like eight or nine years old now. Um, so yes, that was published. Are you ready for this? On my birthday in 2014. <laughs> so as you can imagine, best birthday ever. Um, and as per those guidelines, you, this may be uh, something people remember from Mark Chrislip, the recommended duration of antimicrobial therapy is five days, but treatment should be extended if the infection is not improved within this time period. So these are the results of a prospective non-randomized multicenter pilot trial performed at three institutions, one primary care, uh, two secondary care in uh, Switzerland. Um, so empiric IB antibiotics consisted of amoxicillin clavulanate, 2.2 grams every eight hours. In the case of penicillin allergy, uh, cefuroxine, 1.5 grams every eight hours in case of delayed type allergy, or vancomycin um, in case of immediate type allergy. In case of renal function impairment, doses were adjusted. Oral antibiotics consisted of amoxicillin clavulanate, that's augmentin, or clindamycin, 600 milligrams three times a day. That's a huge dose. The decision about total treatment duration was at the discretion of the responsible physician. I've got some comments on that. But anyway, the primary outcome was the proportion of clinical failure a composite outcome according to the definition, clinical failure was defined as a new increase in symptoms during antibiotic treatment or after switch to oral, two, a second course of antibiotic therapy after discontinuing the first course, three, readmission within 30 days after making the initial diagnosis, or four, death. Cure was defined as an absence of clinical failure. And uh, they actually have this uh, nice chart with the switch criteria, uh, one or more of the following. Um, and they have decreased pain, better general state, decreased local findings, normalization of the clinical uh, criteria, decreased or steady inflammation, mandatory. And then mandatory is you can't be running a fever for at least the last 24 hours, defined as a temperature in Fahrenheit of less than or equal to 37.8. So at some point, we'll talk about what a fever actually is in this prospective pilot trial on uncomplicated infections in hospitalized patients. An algorithm-based switch from IV to oral antibiotic therapy after a maximum of 48 hours was successful in 95% of cases. But one of the caveats, and the one that I found the most interesting, patients were assessed by a senior infectious disease physician after 48 hours to confirm or overrule the switch decision. Mm -hmm. So apparently this algorithm works as long as you then actually have someone 
weigh in and decide whether or not to go ahead or whether or not to not go ahead. So sort of an interesting uh, caveat. So I thought this might be a little deep dive opportunity. Like how are we treating our cellulitis? How are we not treating cellulitis? Sarah, comments? Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, I uh, I feel like there's a um it's it's a little bit dependent on who you're working with so i think that's uh interesting about the having the senior doc at the end <laughs> uh <laughs> so it's uh, hard to sort of think about the algorithm the same because it's not this algorithm that can sort of function on its own independently um for example if there was an id involved which i think is where this would be the most useful yeah, I sort of thought at the end of the day, it was like, so you can have an algorithm, but at the end of the day, why don't you have someone with some experience, someone who's done this for a while? Um, but then again, you know, I get back to the the Delphi consensus where, so what is that senior infectious disease physician making their judgment based on? <laughs> is it science? Is it random? Is it how do they feel that day? Uh, so yeah, I feel like this area uh, needs some updated guidelines. <laughs> Um, well, I have the next article entitled Truth in DARE, D-A-I-R, Duration of Therapy and the Use of Quinolone slash Rifampin-Based Regimens Following Debridement and Implant Retention, the DARE, for Periprosthetic Joint Infections. And this was published in OFID. Uh, so this took a look at a place in ID that also has some variable practice, um, thinking about utility of rifampin-based regimens for adults with hip or knee staph PJI managed with DARE, and the outcome was failure um, of DARE. And so the five-year cumulative incidence of failure in this group was 28%. There was no association between the duration of IV antibiotics and treatment failure, and a shorter duration of subsequent oral antibiotics was associated with a higher risk of failure, uh, which does fit with the DTPO trial that, um, I can't remember exactly when, I think that was last year or end of last year. Um, and in that trial had shown, you know, six weeks being inferior to 12 weeks in these patients who uh, underwent DARE. So for staph PGI, this uh, paper found both use and longer duration of a rifampin-based regimen uh, had a lower risk of failure. Um, and I, I have to plug, because we have almost the same <laughs> title that we did a febrile episode called Truth or Dare, um, talking a little bit about staph PGI. So I recommend people check that out because they, um, Nico and Jonathan, really dig into some of, some of this uh, concepts. All right. I'm going to endorse that same febrile episode. You know, I, I think when people say, oh, I want to go into infectious disease, they, they envision, you know, traveling to the tropics, exciting, you know, fever and travelers, <laughs> like some of the most recent febrile episodes have covered. Um, but, yeah. you know, a lot of our our day-to-day -day, cellulitis, prosthetic joint infections, so uh, really important to be up on the literature so you don't just sort of find that you're just uh, sort of doing what you've been doing without that science behind you. So, all right, the article Efficacy of Doxycycline for Mild to Moderate Community Acquired Pneumonia in Adults, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis of Randomized Controlled Trials. This was published in CID. Um, and here they looked at treatment of community acquired pneumonia, CAP, with doxycycline and suggested that doxycycline was comparable to macrolides or fluoroquinolones in mild to moderate community acquired pneumonia and thus represented a viable treatment option. I will also mention the article, and I just threw this in today, effectiveness of a vancomycin dosing protocol guided by area under the concentration time curve to minimum inhibitory concentration, AUC over MIC, with multidisciplinary team support to improve hospital-wide adherence to a vancomycin dosing protocol, a pilot study. I thought there was a word limit on titles. But anyway, this was published in Infection Control and Hospital Epidemiology. And I have to say, I thought it was striking that the 30-day mortality rate was significantly lower during the post-intervention period, 8.3% versus 20%. So really a striking difference when you're actually... Uh, dosing that vancomycin properly. Yeah. I feel like our last episode, you didn't talk about vancomycin. <laughs> <laughs> it's our usual. Um, we have one fungal paper for you all today. I pulled one from OFID. Outcomes of fungemia in patients receiving extra corporal... Oh, 
I knew I'd mispronounce corporeal <laughs> membrane oxygenation, aka ECMO. In this single center retrospective review of 273 patients who required ECMO support, 5% or 14 cases developed fungemia. Uh, this works out to three and a half infections for a thousand ECMO days. Uh, most commonly, this was Candida albicans, which accounted for 43%, followed next by Candida tropicalis at 21%. The median time to culture clearance was three days, and the median duration of antifungal therapy after clearance was 15 days, and 83% survived to antifungal therapy completion. Of the five patients who completed their antifungal therapy course while on ECMO, two had recurrent Candida albicans infections, um, so specifically pointing out that this is in the setting that they did not have suppressive antifungal therapy after they finish their course while they're still on ECMO with all the tubes in there. So suggesting, you know, this is suggesting that there might be some benefit to either extending the course or using suppressive therapy while remaining cannulated. Um, I read in the paper that only about 2% of ECMO centers routinely provide some sort of antifungal prophylaxis. I thought this was a really great paper because it we don't really know what to do in this space and we're wading into that uh, data light or data free zone. And, you know, I think we always worry about stopping antifungal therapy or antibiotics in patients who have, even if they've cleared their cultures with something like ECMO in place. And so this at least gave a little bit of insight into to cases at their center. Um, so I, I'm curious to see how people think and, and maybe thinking about their own practice, what they've done in the past when they've had similar patients. Because I feel like a lot of times we tend to continue them on therapy. All right. <clears throat> Parasitic. Um, be sure to listen to This Week in Parasitism. And particularly this time, we're actually going to do a deep dive on this particular paper. Uh, we we're supposed to record that earlier today. Things have moved around. So uh, sorry <laughs> about the delay. Um, and now we have malaria vaccine rebound. I, I think this is malaria Paxlovid vaccine rebound. But anyway. Malaria transmission intensity likely modifies RTS S slash AS01 efficacy due to a rebound effect in Ghana, Malawi, and Gabon. And this was published in JID. Um, so this, this vaccine, RTS S slash AS01, everyone get that memorized. Uh, this is the first malaria vaccine to be approved and recommended for widespread implementation by the WHO. Now, the trials reported lower vaccine efficacies in higher incidence sites um, and potentially due to a rebound in malaria cases in the vaccinated children. So the, the idea is that when naturally acquired protection in the control group rises and vaccine protection in the vaccinated wanes concurrently, malaria incidence can become greater actually in the vaccinated than in the control group resulting in negative vaccine efficacies. So the investigators found that three-dose efficacy in the lowest transmission intensity group decreased from 88% to 14.55% over 4.5 years, suggesting that interventions, including giving a fourth dose, um, could be implemented for high transmission settings. Um, it's really an interesting concept, and, and we'll do a deeper dive into this, but this whole concept that because you're vaccinated, because you're not getting infected periodically and developing that premunition, um, if you don't stick with your program, you can actually start to end, underestimate the um, benefit of vaccination should you continue um, to keep that vaccination program implemented. So we will do a deep dive on this. It's a fascinating topic, um, and this is not due to Paxlovid, just by the way. That rebound has nothing to do with Paxlovid, but anyway. <laughs> All right, and miscellaneous. Um, and this is really a miscellaneous therapeutic one. It's our last article. The article, Ultra Short Course Antibiotics for Suspected Pneumonia with Preserved Oxygenation, was published in CID. Now, this was a retrospective study with propensity matching. So uh, all those limitations right up front. So the authors retrospectively identified all patients started on antibiotics for presumed pneumonia in four hospitals with oxygen saturations greater than or equal to 95% on ambient air, that's room air, May 2017 through February 2021. They propensity matched 
patients treated for one to two days versus five to eight days and compared hospital mortality, time to discharge using sub-distribution hazard ratios. Secondary outcomes included readmissions, 30-day mortality, C. difficile infections, hospital-free days, and antibiotic-free days. So they found this is a large group among 39,752 patients treated for possible pneumonia, 10,012 had median oxygen saturations greater than or equal to 95% without supplemental oxygen. Of these, 2,871 were treated for one to two days, about 3,000 for five to eight days, 4,478 patients were propensity matched, and they noted that patients treated for one to two versus five to eight days had similar hospital mortality, um, but less time to discharge, 6.1 versus 6.6, not a lot there, more 30-day hospital-free days, 23.1 versus 22.7, not a big difference there. There was no significant difference in 30-day readmissions, 30-day mortality, 90-day C different infections. So while the authors conclude that one to two days versus five to eight days had similar outcomes, I am left wondering if the antibiotics were stopped after one to two days because that probable diagnosis of pneumonia became a, I'm not sure this is pneumonia and recommend observation off antibiotics. <laughs> what do you think, Sarah? Uh, yeah, I, I second what you say <laughs> that like, how about we try and uh, peel this off and see how it goes. <laughs> uh, well, that brings us to the end of this podcast. As always, the references for this show are available at microbe.tv, the home of our multimedia empire. You can find the infectious disease podcast at Apple podcasts, microbe.tv forward slash podcast. We love to get your questions, comments, and paper suggestions, so please continue to send those to puscast at microbe.tv. Consider supporting the shows of Microbe TV. Go to microbe.tv forward slash contribute. I'm Sarah Dong. You can find me on Twitter at swindong at Febrile Podcast or at febrilepodcast.com. And I am Daniel Griffin. You can find me at parasiteswithoutborders.com on Twitter at Daniel Griffin, MD, as well as on the other podcasts, This Week in Parasitism, This Week in Virology, COVID, and actually now, This Week in Virology, clinical updates covering COVID, polio, and monkeypox. Oh, Thanks so many. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening. We'll be back in two weeks. Another podcast is infectious.